Uh, Andy, uh, just um, about the, the other side. Yeah. Um, what's, your, what's your current policy there? Uh, so, for me, and I think for Mike and most others in our, in our unit, their post op x rays include a full length theme with the other side uh, and detailed questions. And I, th I look at it the other side more as in the same way you would a tumour. Do they have a lesion? Is it painful? If the answer to that is yes and yes, then get on and nail that when it's safe to do so. Uh, probably within the same inpatient stay if they're having pain. If there's a lesion and no pain, what do you do? Um, again, I, I kind of go down the tumour and say, well, if they're walking around with no pain on that, I let them walk on it. But I am very, very specific with them that if they have pain in that hip, that leg, somewhere in the thigh, they come back and they see me seven days a week or someone else in the hospital, but they don't go to their GP, they don't get fobbed off with a bit of arthritis, they get it checked out. The difficult ones when they have pain and no lesion. And then you MR them, and there may or may not be something there, and you're not really sure. Uh, I don't think anyone's got the answer to that. Um, and I think, I mean, you, something certainly your, your, your one is, is the big data, and that's what Brett's going to talk about tomorrow, is trying to get these nationally data-based. They are, to a degree, caught in the NHFD, but not all of them, and there's not a lot of specific data about that. Um, because we see four or five a year on average. We're a reasonably big centre. So I, don't, I doubt many people are seeing even double figures of these a year. So no one's really going to have an idea of what to do until we start to get data on 50, 100, 200 of these going forward. If, if you're nailing profile which is the other side, yeah. if it's in various, do you correct that various on the, on the one which hasn't fractured? So far, I've not had one that I haven't been able to fit the nail down. Uh, I know Tim has recently um, for a slightly different reason. Um, and it straightened up when the nail went in, with a bit of persuasion. Uh, yeah. I think that, that is a difficult one, is if they have pain, you're not sure if they're going to fracture, but they have an unnailable femur in the position it's in, do you fracture it, knowing that it's going to be nightmare to heal? So let's ask the audience, who, who would uh, address the other side if they saw a lesion? Hands up. Okay. Who would address it at the same operation? Good. And who would address it at the same hospital stay? Same hospital stay. Two weeks later. They're normally in. They're normally in for ten days or two weeks. So you just uh, you put it to bed at that time. And Andy, sorry, can I? Go on. Uh, I, I quite enjoy the talk. I certainly don't know what to do with these. Uh, but you, if you put these fractions to valgus, does that not open up the medial side? Uh, it's so it's a simple fracture, and you're <coughs> compressing one side. Does that not open up the other side? So that, that's where the lateral closing wedge comes in. So it, it gets you into valgus, it avoids the distraction on the medial side, but also, we've all seen these, that chronic sclerotic, non-bleeding, non-union. So when they do heal, when, when you follow them up, they'll generally heal medially. They almost never heal on the lateral side, because that isn't part of the acute fracture. So the valgus osteotomy gets you out of varus, doesn't open the medial side, and hopefully makes the bone bleed. I'm not sure if it's the right answer, but it's, what I'm seeing at the moment is definitely wrong. We'll, we'll do Tim then, then Chris. <laughs> <laughs> it's an unusual combination of mechanics and biology, isn't it? And we've been using um, parathyroid hormone to address the biological part of this equation. Are you, have you any experience of that? Uh, so our orthogeotricians have been keeping the database on this, which is where we got the uh, patients from originally. And some of them have had uh, PTH analogues, some haven't. It's, I don't think the evidence is there to support it. It doesn't seem to cause that much problem. Um, I don't think it's the answer to just treat them as a standard fracture and give them PTH. Again, I think just more data is needed on it. Um, where we thought that the mechanics were wrong, we've used uh, PTH and the implant of broken, so it did not correct the pure mechanics. So you cannot drive the biology if the mechanics are wrong. Your implant is still at risk. And that's, that's about 50 with Karen Harding. That's Karen Harding series. So we've... Um we had a big combined series with Belfast, and, the, and, and half of them are actually in the shaft. We always yeah. focused on the subtrock, and they don't heal either. Theoretically, and we've done it a few times for the shaft fractures, uh, if you clamshell them and turn them into a multifragmentary fracture, they then should heal by callus, because the problem here, the biology is absolutely against primary bone remodeling. 
Um, and so when you've got a single fracture line where you're very much often depending on remodeling for healing, it's going to be slow and you can lose the race. If you turn it into a multi-fragmentary fracture, clamshelling it, then, then you get healing by callus. And I've done that a couple of times with success. And it's worth thinking about, particularly for the mechanically where you can do it easily, which is the mid-shaft fractures. How, how big a zone do you do your clamshell? Um, I'm, just think, I'm just thinking if it's all over, over about five centimetres, what, what was conveniently in front of me. It, it's a, that's a rule of thumb as well. <laughs> um, sorry, I've got it. <laughs> the PTH question. 45% um, of these patients can't have PTH due to renal problems and other uh, uh, contraindications. And actually, there's no evidence of PTH in improving healing of these fractures, whatever you read in the American literature. We tried to do a study on it. There was absolutely no evidence um, of it. Is that just because it's rare? And, and cause we, we've used it on a few patients where we've failed to get it to heal with repeat yeah. surgeries, and it's, and it's worked. So. You've probably been to church as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Alex, I was just going to say that the other mistake which people often make is the fact is that the nail, when they are changing the nail, we keep on putting the nail too long. Uh, remember that ever since we got uh, titanium nails, this, this gave us the opportunity of putting long, getting the nail very long, two cross screws distally. But the mechanics of that is awful when you actually look at it. And this is where people have to remember to always nail a bit shorter because it's the, it's the more proximal of the distal cross screws actually affects the mechanics in terms of the torsional capability, especially when these fractures, a lot of them are almost you know, essentially uh, transverse fractures. So it's when you're doing that, it's not just the plate. It's actually making sure that when you redo it, redo and think the whole thing through, uh, getting the, you know, obviously valgus, but it's also the other part, make the nail more stable. Make it nail, nail slightly short. <clears throat> Question for Bob. Uh, Bob, uh, very interesting concept, a bit wacky, as we expect from you. Um, <clears throat> but um, those fractures were all largely of the hypertrophic type, and the, the, the problem was largely a mechanical one. The biology was not really that compromised. But as, you, as we all know, a number of non-unions are because of biological compromise. Do you feel that your mechanical solution is going to heal a biological non-union? I think that um, uh, I think that if you chose to bone roll a group, a whole, the, all the fractures, a proportion of them would heal, quite a sizable proportion. And if you choose to mechanically address the whole group of fractures, a good proportion would heal, and probably those groups would overlap to a much greater extent than we expect. So I, I, I've, got, I've got a number of others where it looks to be much less biologically active than that. So I was asked to put those together because those are a group I've shown at the BOA, but I've got a number which are much less biologically active, and you wouldn't have expected to be quite as quick, but have, but have healed quite satisfactorily. And what, what, I, what I feel... I, I, and the more I look at it, I remain convinced about is, is that the model that we have of the recruitment of a bone healing unit to begin with, which requires fracture movement to get the callus forming and to get the whole industry for forming bone in that area, is helped by movement. So trying to uh, provide that stability initially will not be as much help as providing it once several weeks or several months had passed and the whole unit is already recruited and it's ready to go. And I think David Elliott puts it quite well. There are very few uh, delayed or non-unions, if you operate on them, appear bloodless when you get in there. there, there it's unusual to find that the area biologically inert. And so, so I think that we ascribe biological inactivity to areas where, which are a reflection on the amount of um, movement which is there, which allows callus to form, rather than necessarily the biological structure which is there. So I, th I, think, I think that is worth trying if the situation allows you to place screws across the fracture line, you don't need to realign it if it's, if, you, if it's an adjuvant to what you have there previously. Such a minimal thing to do, which is why I've, I've done it in other, in, I've sort of pushed the envelope in it now, and it does not seem to fail. <coughs> You'll catch number, and then we're going to have to break, um, because we're going up to the last question. Oh, sorry, I've got two questions, one for you and one for Alex. Uh, just a quick question to uh, Andy. Andy, uh, you said, did you say you don't use it in a recon mode? Did I get that right? No, no, I said I uh, don't use a recon nail. Okay. Um, I think purely, again, mechanically speaking, as a topic, <coughs> 
the two recon screws going to the head are fine. It's yeah. the obliquity of the, of the third hole, if you like, for the standard locking mode that gives that nail an inherent weakness in there. And these fractures are going to be slow to heal. No matter how well we do them, no matter how well I think I'm getting there with chains and mechanics, I know they're going to be slow to heal. And with that lady, uh, I used a recon because I could only just get a nine into her. And as I said, I've got, an, I've got a lovely x-ray at six weeks. And 18 hours later, I've got an x-ray that nail snapped in half. And it's See? gone straight through that unfilled hole that comes uh, superlateral to inframedial. So you rely on the, uh, the oblique screw for the proximal locking then? You don't put any... No, no, so no. I, I use a normal Kefla Medullary nail. Okay. Uh, I just happen to use that in her, because okay. our standard is a gamma, which is 11, that wouldn't fit. Okay. Okay. Um, but, yeah, it, it very rapidly failed through that unfilled area of weakness in the design of the nail, which is good for, mo you know, for most fractures, but... Uh, Thank I'll you. Be you. Quick question, Alex. Uh, for the adjuvant plating, I mean, you said you respect biology. Uh, I, I'm sure I'm a clumsy surgeon. And I, I can't not, you know, do some biological damage without putting a plate. I mean, any any tips as to how do you? Yeah. So you, 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 you stay extra periosteal, and um, if you're uh, placing those 2.7, the footprint of the 2.7 plate is tiny. So the amount of sort of uh, periosteal injury you may occur there is, is very small indeed. So you're, you're addressing, um, the, especially in those fragment-specific ones where you've got four or five little plates, but you're addressing the mechanics for each fragment. And if you get the mechanics right for a fragment, the biology, biology is going to be sort of quicker to heal anyhow. So you, 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 you're right, you've got to be careful. But, um, I think Especially the humeral plate that you, that was quite a yeah, big plate. Was. I was just wondering how, you know, you did, obviously well, it went on to heal, good it, that, it but was, then... But with your anter I mean, a long anterolateral approach to the humerus, there is, you know, you can just slide under what re remnant of brachialis is there, and you just need a little muscle window at the top and the bottom for an anterior plate. You stay extra periosteal, and it just changes the mechanics of that long lateral plate favourably um, for a big bridge span like that. So it is biologically friendly surgery. Key. Thank you. So we're going to move...